and we were talking about we're going to be talking about uh, solving systems of linear inequalities. First thing we're going to go through is a five minute check over section 1.5. Uh, it should be pretty quick, pretty easy, uh, because this is the one that we just had homework on. Okay, so first one, it says which inequality is shown in the graph? Uh, first thing you want to do is you want to analyze where my y-intercept is, what's my slope. As you can tell, none of these equations have a different slope or a different y-intercept. So really what separates them is the greater than, great than, less than, or equal to and less than signs. In this case, we're looking for one that is less than because we have a dashed line as our boundary. And it's less than because Y is shaded down. So this would correspond to answer D. Okay, the next one says, Eleanor is hosting a bake sale to raise money for a local charity. She needs to raise at least $500. She is selling cookies for $5 a piece and marshmallow treats for $2 a piece. Write an inequality that represents the number of C cookies and M marshmallow treats that Eleanor needs to sell. So here, we need to show that 500 is less than or equal to the total amount of cookies sold, which would be from 5C, and then added to the total number of marshmallows sold, which would be 2M. So looking at answer A, it has it set up properly with the 5C and the 2M, but you can see that 500 is greater than or equal to. So that's not really what we're looking for. That would be more in the case of if we were uh, looking to spend $500 and how many cookies and marshmallows we could buy. Here we have marshmallows is greater than or equal to two fifths cookies plus 500. Uh, that one wouldn't work. D M is less than or equal to five halves cookies plus 500. So C is the correct answer because 500 is less than or equal to the total of cookies sold or the amount of cookies sold revenue and then added to the amount of revenue raised by the marshmallows at 2M. So answer C is the answer that we are looking for. The next one, Brock is at a stockyard sale and has toy cars for 25, uh, 25 cents and toy trains for 50 cents. Brock has $10. How many cars and trains can he buy? So this one, it works best if we set up the inequality first. So this one, he has $10 and he can't spend more than that. Okay, so $10 needs to be greater than or equal to uh, 0.25 for toy trains. Okay, and I'm going to use trains as Y plus or point two, oh, toy cars. Oh, never mind. So toy cars, 0.25x plus 0.5y, which is trains. So this x variable is the number of cars. This y variable is the number of trains that he can buy. Okay, and rather than solving this, I'm actually gonna graph it. You can graph this in standard form. So if we go to Desmos, and I will input it just the way that I read it on the board. So I have that $10 is greater than or equal to 0.25x. Plus 0.5y. Okay, remember that x is the amount of cars that he can sell or that he can buy, and y is the amount of trains that he can buy. So if you wanted to spend all of his money on trains, he'd be able to buy 20 trains. Same thing, if you wanted to spend all of his money on cars, he would spend, he could buy 40 cars and zero trains. But now it's time to just analyze our answer options. So you should be able to see the slides again. Uh, and we're gonna try to find which ones of these actually fall in that shaded area. So I'm gonna work from the bottom to the top. So 10 cars and 20 trains. So 10 cars is gonna be right here. And if I go to the absolute max, you can see that he, if he were to buy 10 cars, he'd be able to buy 15 trains. And since it's 10 and 20, that would not fly. 
Okay, so answer D cannot be a possibility. Letter C, 25 cars and 10 trains. So again, I go back to Desmos. Here's 25 cars. If we go to the absolute max, you can see 25 would allow for seven and a half trains. So 25 cars and 10 trains wouldn't work. B, 15 cars and 15 trains. So 5, 10, 15, come to the absolute max. If I buy 15 cars, I can only buy 12 and a half trains. So that one doesn't work. So therefore, by process of elimination, it has to be A. But if I want to double check, I would go out to 35 here. And you can see that 35, two and a half. So if I buy 35 cars, I could buy two and a half trains and have 50 cents left over. So letter A is gonna be our answer here. Okay, and that's just graphing in standard form. Uh, you could revert that back to slope intercept form if you wanna graph it by hand, but Desmos handles that form pretty easily. And then our last one, uh, graph the inequality, 3x is minus 8y is greater than or equal to 12. This one, since we don't really want to plug it into Desmos, we could. But in order to put this into y-intercept form, remember that we want to isolate the y variable. Okay, so slope-intercept form, we're trying to isolate the y. So we're given 3x minus 8y is greater than or equal to 12. So first thing is I want to get rid of my 3x and move it to the other side by subtracting it from both sides. So now I'm left with a negative 8y is greater than or equal to a negative 3x plus 12. Okay, then to finalize Isolating the variable, I divide both sides by negative eight. I'll get y is less than because I'm dividing by a negative, so I have to flip the sign. That's gonna be a positive three eighths x plus three halves. A negative three halves. Yep, negative three halves where negative three over two is my y-intercept and my slope is going up by three eighths. And there we go for answer B. So what we've previously done is we've graphed and solved linear inequations, and we've done that with linear inequalities. That was section 1.5. Uh, now we're going to solve systems of linear inequations graphically, and we're going to solve them algebraically. Okay, graphically, once again, it's a simple, easy way to solve, but it's not the most exact. Uh, the best that we can do is an estimation. Okay, but we can prove it algebraically pretty simply and easily using two methods called the substitution and the elimination. Where did my good marker go? Okay, so your new vocabulary. We have a break even point. Is this it? Yeah. We have a break even point. That's a popular term, uh, especially in the world of business. A break even point would be where our where we begin to make money in a revenue. In this context, the break-even point is the point at which two graphs cross, okay? The break-even point is the solution to our system of equations. And a system of equation is more than one equation with the same variables. We'll be typically using X and Y, uh, but it can be any type of variables, but they will be the same between the two. Okay, then we have consistent. Consistent means that the two graphs or the two equations intersect at at least one point. Okay, 
So there's an intersection. Inconsistent means that these graphs don't intersect at all, or in other words, they're parallel. Okay, you have independent. So this would be an association with consistent, okay, because we cross, and it independent means that it crosses at exactly one point. And dependent means that they exact that they intersect at an infinite number of points, or in other words, they're the same line. Okay, so consistent and inconsistent, do the graphs touch each other? And then independent versus dependent, at how many points do they touch each other? Independent means one and only one. Dependent means infinitely many times, meaning that you have the same line. Okay, the first method algebraically solved we're gonna use is a substitution method. Uh, it's pretty simple, pretty easy. We solve for a variable and then plug it back in. Uh, the elimination method is also pretty simple, uh, but we manipulate the equation so that we end up with opposite terms and then add them to be left with one variable and then we solve it and then we plug it back in. Okay, so here is the display for consistent and independent. So consistent, once again, meaning that they intersect. Independent meaning that they intersect at one point, so there's one solution. Okay, consistent and dependent, it's the same line, so any x value is gonna map onto both equations. And then inconsistent only happens when there are parallel lines or no solution. So just remember that your graph is a snapshot and that lines continue on to infinity. So unless these lines are parallel and wholly parallel, they will intersect at some point. It might be at the x value of one million, but they will intersect if they are not parallel. That's because they continue off into leaving, continuing to infinity. If they have differing slopes, they absolutely have to. Okay. So solving a system of equations by completing a table. So once again, a solution is the, is the XY value where if we were to plug it into either of these equations, we would end up with the same answer. Okay, so the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna get these into Y, uh, y in terms of X, or Y equals X plus this, or Y equals X plus that. So our first equation is x plus y is equal to three. Getting that into terms of y or isolating the y variable, we subtract three, uh, x from both sides. We'd be left with y is equal to a negative x plus three. Okay, that way we can plug in x values and get y. Then our second one, we have two negative two x plus y is equal to negative six. Once again, we would add 2x from both sides so that these on this side are gonna cancel. We're left with y is equal to 2x minus six. Okay, so now we wanna plug in points to determine where they intersect. We're gonna build a table. Okay, and if we just analyze it, this first graph starts at three, at zero, three, because that's our y-intercept, and it decreases by a slope of one. Okay, so from zero, we have the y-value of three. Then from one, we're gonna have two, two, we're gonna have one, three, we're gonna have zero in x, y. This one, you can see it's gonna be increasing faster because it has a slope of two x, but it starts less. So I'm gonna plug in zero, one, two, and three. We'll put this as equation one. And we'll put this in as equation two. Okay, so for E1, E2, when I plug in zero, zero plus three, my Y value is three. When I plug in zero in the equation two, two times zero is zero minus six, I get a negative six, okay? When I plug in one into equation one, 
A negative one plus three gives me two. When I plug in one here, two times one is two minus six is a negative four. Okay, to help myself, because I could be going the wrong way to finding my intersection. It helps to find the difference between these two variables. Okay, are they getting closer together or are they getting farther apart? They're getting farther apart, I might want to go to negative one, negative two, okay, to see if I can bring them closer together. So the difference, three minus a negative six gives me nine. Okay, these are nine units apart, three and negative six. Two minus a negative four is six units apart. So you can see my graphs are coming closer together and the difference columns tells me that. Okay, so that means I'm going the correct way in my X values. I should continue going all the way down into the positives. If these were flipped, where my difference was increasing, where my Y values are getting farther apart, then I need to go the other way in my X values. Okay, so if I plug in two into equation one, a negative two plus three yields the Y value of one. Two here, uh, two times two is four, minus six is a negative two. And you can see that they're still getting closer together with the difference of three between one and negative two. When I plug in three, negative three plus three gives me zero. And then when I plug in three here, two times three is six minus six, so zero. Okay, so what this tells me is that these two graphs cross at the point three zero. Or in other words, if I plug in a three into both equations, I get the same y value. Okay, so my solution for these systems of equations is going to be three zero. Okay, meaning that they're the same exact point. That point falls onto both lines. So once again, we want to solve for y in each equation. So x plus y equals 3 turns into y is, y is equal to a negative x plus 3. Negative 2x plus y turns into a y is equal to 2x minus 6. Okay, and that's just by isolating the x value or isolating the y value. Then here we're plugging in and you can see the book doesn't do the difference. I like to do that to make sure that I am on the right track. Okay, so when they plugged in one, they got two. When they plugged in two, they got one. When they plugged in three, they got zero for y1 here. That's their first equation or equation one. When they plugged in one, they got negative four. When they plugged in two, they got negative two. When they plugged in three, they got zero. So since when we plug in the x value of three and we're yielded zero in both equations, that means that the point three zero falls on both graphs. Okay, or that is our solution of our system. To describe the solution, okay, it's not the same line. They do intersect. So we would call this consistent independent. Okay, consistent because they intersect, independent because they intersect at one point. Okay, here we go once again. The solution of the system of equations. And we can build a table. So the first equation that we were given, I keep losing my mind. So I have x plus y is equal to two for equation one. And I know you can't see what I'm writing. Equation two is equal to x minus 3y is equal to a negative 6. First step, we want to solve for y. So we want to isolate the variables. OK, 
Okay, isolate this y variable. Equation one is pretty simple. We subtract x from both sides. We're left with a y is equal to a negative x plus two, and that's P1. Now we're gonna be using equation two. A little bit harder because it's a two step. First step, we subtract x from both sides. We're left with a negative three y is equal to a negative x minus six. Okay, then we're gonna divide by negative three on both sides. So that y is equal to one third x plus two. Okay, so here again, I'm gonna build my table and I always start with the point zero one. I have E1, E2, and the difference. So when I plug in zero into this equation in the negative x plus two, I'm given the y value of two because zero plus two is always two. When I plug in here, did I solve that right? Yeah. Y is equal to a negative one third x plus two. So when I plug in zero, I get two, my difference is zero. So my graph should intersect at B, zero, two. See if I'm right. I better be right or I did something wrong. Ha ha. And there's the definitive proof. Once again, that's saying if we plug in the same the same x value we into both equations, we get the same y value from each equation, okay? This one, I should have been able to pick it up once I got the equations done. That's because they have the same constant. We solved it into a negative x plus two for the first one. And then our second equation, once we solved for y, was y is equal to one third x plus two. Since they had the same constant, when I plug in zero into both of those equations, I'm gonna get the same y-intercept. So just little tricks and tips that can help make yourself more efficient without having to do a ton of work. Okay, here we go. So that's how you solve them by a table. Table's awesome uh, when they intersect, okay? However, what you might realize is that they might not intersect in a total and a whole integer. They might intersect between two values, like at 1.5, a value that we wouldn't really want to plug in, okay? So table is still an estimation, uh, but it, you can do it pretty quick, pretty easy. The next way to solve these is by graphing, okay? Once again, the first step is we're gonna put it into a format that we can use. So we have x minus two y is equal to zero. And then we have x plus y is equal to six. Same as putting it into a table. We are going to solve for y to get it into slope intercept form. So on this one, we subtract x from both sides. We're left with negative two y is equal to a negative x. We divide by a negative two on both sides to finish off isolating the variable and we're left with y is equal to one half x. Those two negatives make a, problem, a positive, good there. This one, much simpler. We're done as soon as we subtract x from both sides and we're left with y is equal to a negative x plus six. Okay, so now it's time to graph them. Here I've got my nice new board. We're gonna count by ones, okay? The first one, when I plug in zero into here, I get zero, zero. Okay, so zero, zero. If I plug in one, I get 0.5. If I plug in two, I get one. So 1.5 is right about there. Two, one is right about there. So I'll draw my line. That's a pretty good looking line. 
whoever thought of make, using straight edges because it's genius. And then on my second one, if I plug in zero, I'll do this one in a different color. Hopefully we'll be able to see it. So when I plug in zero, I get six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. When I plug in one, I get five. So that's right about here. Remember that you, at minimum, the, mi the minimum amount of points that you need to draw a line is two and a straight edge. That is not a good line. There we go. So, and if I look, and all I got to do is I got an intersection right here. Okay, this point right there. So now I got to count my X's and Y's to determine about where that intersects. So for starting at the origin, one, two, three, four, plugs in at four. And then if I go up, it's at two. So this is the intersection point, an estimation of the intersection point. Okay, understand that's an estimate. What we got to do is we got to plug these in for x and y, and it doesn't matter if you use your solve for y equation or the original equation, but we want to plug it in to make sure that we are correct. Okay, so I'm going to use my solved equations because they're a little bit easier. My x value is 4, my y value is 2, so 2 is equal to 1 half times 4. 1 half times 4 is 2, so 2 is equal to 2. That checks out. On this side, 2 is equal to a negative 4 plus 6, because I plugged 4 in for x, 2 in for y. Negative 4 plus 6 is 2, so 2 is equal to 2. That checks out. And then once again, it doesn't matter if I plug it into this form or this form, I should get the same answer. Okay, because all I did to get to this form was rework it. And those two are equivalent. But the key is graphing is an estimation. So if you want to be sure that you're right, plug it back in. Okay, so we write each equation in slope intercept form like we did. So solve for y. Okay, so y is equal to 1 half x, y is equal to a negative x plus 6. The graphs appear to intersect at 4, 2. Once again, that's just by graphing them. In order to graph, we need at least two points. Okay, and then we just count where the intersection is. And then we want to check them and substitute them back in. So they do it off the original equations. They plug in 4 for x, 2 for y into both equations. And you can see on the left, 4 minus 2 times 2, 4 minus 4 is equal to 0. That's going to check out. And 4 plus 2 is equal to 6. So we have 0 equals 0 and 6 equals 6, which shows that we are correct okay, with our estimation that we got from graphing. We'll go through that one. Okay. Here, classifying systems, once again, are they can be consistent or inconsistent, independent or dependent. So if they're inconsistent, they won't be dependent or independent. That only is an, assist, an association with consistent. So the first step we're going to do is we're going to write each equation in the slope-intercept form. Okay, so you can see x minus y equals 5 turns into y equals x minus 5. Not sure if they did that one right. It should be a negative x. Okay, and x plus 2y is equal to a negative 4. Turns into y is equal to a negative 1 half x plus minus 2. Okay, and then they graph them. Since these intersect, right, that makes it consistent. And since they intersect at one point, that makes them independent. Okay. Remember, they will only be inconsistent if we have parallel lines. So here we're going to graph and describe them. So we write each equation in slope-intercept form. 
y is equal to 5 half x for 15x minus 6y. Okay, and that's just isolating the y variable. 5x minus 2y equals 10 equals y equals 5 halves x minus 5. Right here, we can tell that these are inconsistent and that they are uh, in the, that they're inconsistent. They're parallel lines. They have the same exact slope, but they do not have the same intercept. So since these are parallel, they are inconsistent. We gotta get to the hard part. Okay, first one of the hard part, substitution method. I highly recommend writing these steps down. I will give you a couple minutes to do so. Uh, basically, when you're looking at the substitution method, you are trying to solve these wholly algebraic. Okay, and the first step for the substitution method, we have to solve one equation for one of the variables. Does not matter whether we solve it for X or Y. Okay, the second step, is after we have the first variable solved, we're gonna substitute the resulting expression into the other equation to replace the variable. And then we're gonna solve it again for the one variable that's remaining. And then we're gonna substitute it back in to solve for the other variable. Okay, so you can see it's a lot of solving and a lot of substituting. That's why it's called the substitution method. got to get to the end. Oh wow. We still got a little bit. All right. So first thing that we do, let's get the question. Okay. Lancaster Woodworkers Furniture Store builds two types of wooden outdoor chairs. A rocking chair sells for 265. An Adrian Dack chair with footstool sells for 320. The books show that last month the business earned $13,930 for the 48 outdoor chairs, chairs that were sold. How many rocking chairs were sold? Okay, so first, out of this, we can draw two equations. Okay, we can write two equations using the variables. We'll use X and Y. So, Adrian Deck equal to x, rocking chairs is equal to y. Okay, first equation. They sold a total of 48 chairs. They do not specify which chairs were sold. So we can write that as equation 48 is equal to x plus y. Okay, our second equation, $13,930. Is equal to 265 for a rocking chair, 265y. Okay, and then Adrian Deck chair with footstool sells for 320 plus 320x. So the amount of chairs, Adrian Deck plus what plus rocking chairs equals 48, and then the amount of revenue. We get $265 for each rocking chair. We get $320 for each Adrian deck. Okay, first step of the substitution method is we want to solve for either one of these equations for either one of these variables. Okay, you can see that it's going to make more sense to solve this equation. It's much easier. So they ask for specifically rocking chairs. So I'm going to solve it for rocking chairs. Rocking chairs is y, so I'm going to isolate my y variable. And I get 48 minus x is equal to y after I subtract x from each side. Okay, so this is step one. Step two, we want to plug this in for y. So we get 13,930 is equal to 265 
times a quantity of 48 minus x plus 320x. Okay, now I have to carry, I have to finish solving them. So the first thing I got to do is use the distributive property to get rid of my parentheses. So 265 times 48. is equal to 12,720. Minus 265x, because I have to distribute it back in. And that's going to be plus 320x. And that is all equal to 13,930. Okay, the next step that I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify these, combine my like terms. So 320 minus 265, because they're both with the x. That's going to simplify down to 55x. And then I'm going to subtract 12,720 from both sides so that I'm just left with 55x. So 13,930 minus 12,720 is equal to 1,010, which is equal to 55x. Okay, and then to solve for x, I would divide 12,010 divided by 55, and I get an x value which is equal to 22. Okay, that's the result of step two. So once again, I solve for a variable, that's step one. I plugged it into the other equation to solve for the other variable, that's step two. Now step three, I have to plug it back into either one of these equations to solve for y. So in this case, this equation is much easier to solve. So it started out as 48 is equal to x plus y. So I'll write step three up here. So 48 is equal to x plus y. We found our x value is 22. So 48 is equal to 22 plus y. We solve for y. We subtract 22 from each side. We can show that y is equal to 26. So the solution to our variable or our problem is 22, 26, with 22 being the x value, y being 26. But the question asks how many rocking chairs were sold? Rocking chairs represented the variable of y. So 26 rocking chairs were sold. Okay, be sure that we're answering the question. In this case, like I said, it's a lot of algebra, but it's not the most difficult thing in the world. Step one, we solve. Step two, we plug it in, and then we solve again. And then step three, we solve for the other variable. So in this case, we know it's 26 rocking chairs. So you're asked to find the number of rocking chairs sold. They set up two equations. So they use X is equal to the represent the number of rocking chairs and Y represent the number of A and DAC chairs. Once again, that's just assigning a variable. We could have used R and A. Uh, just the most common are X and Y. So I felt comfortable using X and Y. Uh, X and Y. It's just assigning a variable. You can use whatever variables you like as long as they are consistent between both equations or else you're violating what a system of equations is. So X plus Y is equal to 48. So that's the total number of chairs that was sold. Okay, and we got that straight from the problem. 265x plus 320y is equal to 13,930. That's because the rocking chairs for each one that they sell, they get $265. For each Adrian DAC chairs, I'm probably not saying that right, they get $320. And the total amount earned was 13,930. So here's step one. Solve for one variable. So in this case, they've decided to solve for y. Okay, that's step one. Step two, once you've solved for y, 
we have to substitute it back into that equation. So once they substitute, they get 265x plus 320 times the quantity of 48 minus x is equal to 13,930. Okay, and that's the substitution portion. Once they carry everything out, they get 265 plus 15,360 minus 320x is equal to 13,930. Once again, they get 15,360 from distributing 320 into 48. So 320 times 48 is 15,360. Then they solve for x, okay, or they simplify, and they begin to solve for x. They divide by 55 and they get 26. They set, they set at the beginning that x was the value for uh, rocking chairs. So they know at this point they've sold 26 rocking chairs. They would have to plug it back in to find that they sold 22 Adrian Deck chairs. Okay, so they were fortunate enough because they're strategic to solve it after step two. Okay, because they were aware. For me, I solved for it a little bit. Should have solved it the other way. Okay, at the very beginning. But that's all right. You still got the same answer. Okay. They check it by graphing. So that's just them graphing 48. Uh, is equal to x plus y, and then graphing 13,930 is equal to 265y plus 320x. Okay, and you can see the intersection happens at 26, 22. And we are golden there. Substitution method. Okay, here we go. We'll work through one more, or I can't. we got to go to the elimination method. Uh, we'd set this one up the exact same way. Uh, so we would have one equation that says 330 is equal to x plus y. And then we would have 6405 is equal to 2450 times x plus 1650 times y. Same exact thing that we did here. And then we would solve for one of the variables. Plug it back in. But now we're off to the elimination method which should be the last thing that I have for you. Okay, the elimination method is a little bit easier, I would say, but it's a little bit harder to identify when we're able to use it. It centers around trying to get two of the variables in opposite terms. So if we have a 3y, we want to try to get a negative 3y. Okay? And we do this by multiplying both, one or both equations, to result in two equations that contain opposite terms. And then we're going to add the equations so that we eliminate one variable. And we're going to solve. And then we're going to substitute into either equation to solve. Okay, so we are searching for the opposites. You guys shouldn't be backing up yet. We still got 10 minutes, man. Especially if you're in my algebra 2 class. I know, you're in independent study. You're lucky. She's not. Okay, so we're going to use the elimination method to solve the systems of equations. So we're given x plus 2y is equal to 10, and then x plus y is equal to 6. Okay, from here, what I want to do is I want to multiply these to try to get opposite terms. So here I have an x in both equations. So the easiest way to get this done is multiply one of these by a negative one. So I'm going to multiply the lesser one. By negative one, negative one times x turns into a negative x. Negative one times y turns into a negative y. Negative one times six turns into a negative six. Okay, so I multiply them so I get opposite terms, x and a negative x. Then I'm going to add that to the first equation. Okay, a negative x plus x is equal to zero. A negative y plus 2y is equal to y. A negative 6 plus 10 is equal to 4. So what I'm left with is that y is equal to 4. Okay, this one's pretty simple. Okay, at this point, this is step two. Okay, 
Now we breathe, uh, this would be step one here where we multiply. This would be step two where we add them together. Step three is to plug this in to either one of the original equations and solve. So I had x plus 2y is equal to 10. If I plug in 4 for y, I get x plus 2 times 4 is equal to 10. That's x plus 8 is equal to 10. If I solve for x by isolating 8 on both sides, I'm given that x is equal to 2. Or in other words, my intersection point is at 2, 4. The x value is 2, the y value is 4. Okay, and that's the elimination method. So here they multiplied by a negative 1 so that they could get a negative x value to eliminate it. They were left with y is equal to 4, which is exactly what we got. Then they plug it back in, and it could be plugged into either equation. It does not matter. You'll get the same answer because they both represent the same thing. So they plug y into x plus y, so it's x plus 4 is equal to 6. And then they solve for x to get x is equal to 2. So the solution is 2, 4. Okay.